Touchdown Tampa Bay. You're listening to the PewterCast. Well, hey guys, welcome to the PewterCast. I am Brent Allen, your host, and boy, oh boy, do Ren and I have a special show for you guys for today. Uh, what you guys are about to hear is the audio from a recent uh, guest spot that Ren and I did over at a different show, a uh, new show, new show to us. He's been around for uh, a little over a year, we found out, um, but he's over on YouTube, Mr. Bucks Nation. You guys want to make sure you go check out his channel. He's doing all kinds of great work over there. Uh, most of his stuff are, are little short uh, very digestible videos, uh, player profiles, and um, breakdowns of, of different pieces. So you guys want to make sure you check him out over there on YouTube, Mr. Bucks Nation. That is what you guys are going to be hearing today. It was a great conversation we had with him, and uh, you guys are really going to love it. I, I think you guys will like it, kind of recapping a lot of, uh, you know, the end of the off season, so to speak, you know, as we, we turn the corner here looking towards training camp. Uh just a reminder, you can get in touch with us here at the show at the Pewtercast on Twitter or on Facebook.com forward slash the Pewtercast. Or if you're a little more winded than 280 characters, shoot us an email to the Pewtercast at gmail.com. Also, rate and review us on iTunes. That is always appreciated. We always prefer the five star kind, but whichever one you choose, we'll still read it on an upcoming episode of the Pewtercast. One other thing, you guys have probably heard me talk about it by now, but just in case you haven't, patreon.com forward slash the Pewtercast. That's where you can go to get involved with the show for a small recurring monthly donation. You can become a patron of the Pewtercast, and depending on the level you choose, you get different kinds of kickbacks. Some of those things include exclusive content. Some of that includes pre-released content. Some of that's going to include um, a monthly hangout with either Ren or me, or maybe sometimes both of us. You even can go to a game. You maybe could even be a guest on the show. You guys go over there, patreon.com forward slash the Pewtercast. You can check out all the details over there. Join the growing community that is happening over there. Uh, I want to say thanks to everyone who has already joined us at Patreon. So uh, guys, without any further delay, here is the show with our new friend over at Mr. Bucks Nation. What's going on, James here, and welcome back to another live stream. I am joined today by Brent and Ren. It is the co-host of the Pewtercast. Guys, how are you? We're doing great, guys. How's it going? It's going pretty good, right? Never been better. Excited to be on. First time uh, having a conversation with James and uh, uh, looking forward to it. Um, I will not be playing PUBG, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am really happy to have you guys on because um, I've, I've seen your guys' show, you know, the Pewtercast one out, and I, like I um, was telling um, Brent earlier, you guys are doing this current series where it's like the off-season tour. And Ren, you don't you don't like the name of that, but still, um, <laughs> um, I'm curious. Like that's actually the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is kind of your own show and links to Brent's Twitter, Ren's Twitter, PewCast Twitter, and the podcast itself are all going to be down in the description below. But the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is, you know, you've you've both been able to go to these training camps and whatnot, and you have this whole kind of mini series dedicated to just going around and being a part of all these Buccaneers experiences and whatnot. How has that mm -hmm. been so far for both of you? Um, you, um, you guys can take turns answering this question, but like, how's it been like going to these training camps and watching practices and stuff like that? Do you feel like the experiences have been good, bad, somewhere in between? Um, just kind of give me your overall thoughts about that. Well, I, I think my initial thought is, uh, hey, go back and check out our episodes and find out exactly how it's been. <laughs> uh, <laughs> da -da. Next question. <laughs> no, it's, you know, it, it's been fun. Um, there's been, we've had access to some things this summer uh, due to uh, me being a season ticket holder, a uh, season pass holder. Mm -hmm. So that's given us some access. We've also uh, been able to develop a relationship with some people within the organization and getting to talk to them has given us some access to some things. Uh, we are not credentialed media, so we don't have unfettered access uh, 
well, the media has fettered access, but you, you know what I mean. Like we, mm-hmm. we're not able we don't to have top go, clearance. Go, yeah, yeah, we're we're not that. So there's and there's a little bit where I'm kind of okay with that because we're fans and we want to keep it as fans. And uh, so being able to be a part of those. Uh, there's like the draft party, you know, we, uh, there were lots of different draft parties, a couple of different things that we could have done there. And this year we decided to go to the one at the stadium, you know, the, the official one put on by the Buccaneers and, uh, they were gracious enough to let us actually bring the recording equipment in, which is typically a big no, no. Um, and, uh, you know, Ren and I, we, we were literally popping around the stadium, like recording in different spots, you know, around the stadium, which was kind of fun. Mm. Uh, and then, we got to do a tour of One Buck Place and actually recorded a couple episodes in there. There's actually an episode that we recorded way back then. I think it's the one about the tour, Ren. Yeah. Uh, that one is set to come out. You know, we're in what I call this long, dark night of football uh, where there's nothing that's going to be happening. So I've kind of held that one back a little bit. Um, so there, there's just been some fun things that we've been able to get to be a part of. I think it's in, it's it's captured our, our off season fairly well and, and helped us move forward. And, you know, who knows what it'll be next year? Uh, it wasn't like this last year. So mm. um, we'll see. But for this for this off season, uh, it's been fun. I think it, it all depends on sort of how many of these things you've been to. Like I remember the first time I ever went to a training camp practice, I was like a kid in a candy store. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wasn't so much like, hey, there's Jameis. Oh, my God. Like, hey, there's Mike Evans. I was like, hey, look, there's Rick Stroud. Hey, look, there's Greg Allman. Like, mm-hmm. oh, my God. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's like it's Steve Isbis. Look, look. Oh, my God. Scott Reynolds. Like, oh, 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 it's Mark Cook. Oh, OK, whatever. <laughs> um, so. You know, and then last year I went to every open training camp you could, except for military day. Uh, obviously, I, well, it's not obviously, but I, I'm, I've never been in the military, so uh, and I'm not in the military, so I didn't go to that one. So showing up for these two days of mini camp, day one and day two of mini camp, um, yeah, it was fun because like, oh, it's the first time you get to see the Bucks this year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of those questions were answered when everybody was in camp. Like, is JPP going to be on the starting D line? You know, uh, where is uh, OK? Now Brent Grimes is in camp. Who's starting outside corner? Who's mm-hmm. playing nickel? So those things were great. And then day two with the lightning scare uh, and they moved it into the indoor facility. That was a lot of fun. Um it, it seemed like it just felt like you're a little more freer to move around. Uh, it seemed like a little bigger. Uh, you weren't sort of anybody's way when you're moving around. Uh, you're much, much closer to the players. Uh, if there was any sort of position drill you wanted to get up closer, you could actually hear what the coaches were saying or at least sort of make out what they're saying. You could get that close to them. So that was, you know, a lot of fun. But as far as like, you know, good experience, bad experience, how do they treat you? They're always really nice. Like the staff is is always been really nice. Uh, And, you know, not to be, you know, like one of those curmudgeon media guys that you hear and then you you hear them sort of complain about, oh, I got to do like 30 straight days of Bucks minicamp. And everyone's like, you get paid to watch football for a living and it's my favorite team. Like, shut up. But, uh, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but uh but, uh, you know, I've gotten to the point where it's like, it's freaking hot. Like, this is hot. Yeah, uh, you know, you and there's and d- when you watch a practice after you sort of get over the awe of being there and seeing everything and, you know, uh, the surrealness wears off. Uh, there's no, really only about 30 minutes of practice that are worth watching. And those like the seven on sevens, the 11 on 11s. And the rest of the time when they're in position drills and, mm-hmm. and you know, and the music's blaring and they're just you're sort of like, you know, or maybe they're going helmets off quarter speed. You're kind of just like, eh, all right. Like, you know, that's when you sort of look down your phone or you talk to somebody, go grab an icy pop. Overall, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of fun as being a Buck fan. Uh, but uh, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, Ren, Ren, you've hit you've hit the point now where you're just like, uh, business as usual, right? <laughs> just kind of just kind of going in, doing your job, and then heading out. I was gonna say, I, I think it's cool that you guys um, can go to these because it's, you know, it's it's kind of like you don't you get to see and hear some stuff that like isn't you know it's not brought up all the time. You know, I, I like um, Ren. I remember in, in the latest episode of your podcast, um, you both you were talking about how Mike Evans was sitting. You know, basically right in front of you in a situation where it's like you get to see how like Mike Evans 
decides like, oh, maybe this isn't a good idea that I'm sitting here right in front of all these fans. Maybe I should get up. You know, it's kind of cool that you get to see that um, personal personal side of them, right? You know, and you and like wait, I, and you also said in the podcast, you know, you can hear the coaches, and you just said that a few seconds ago. Where it's like you can hear Buckner talking to the defensive line. You can see McCoy is also taking charge as a as a leader. And it's you know, mm. whereas at the at surface value, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, Gerald McCoy. He, uh, you know, he isn't a very strong leader, you know, this, that and the other. Um, would you guys say that, like, just from like your own experiences now showing up and it's like, would you say that like guys who might not get as much credit as they do, do they step up as leaders? Guys like McCoy, like Quan, like even Levante David, do they kind of like try and tutor guys more than other people lead on? Or is that kind of is that kind of more true? Well, let me let me start this. I want to back up, um, and mm-hmm. and I'm gonna. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I I'm just gonna say this. I think that I have the best co-host out of any Buccaneers podcast out there in Ren. Uh, he mm-hmm. does a really fantastic job, especially Agreed. with his practices. As, you know, <laughs> he's humble too, uh, especially uh, you know like with the training camp diaries, which you know we're planning on those coming back again of not just saying, hey, here's what's happening on the field, which, by the way, that's what you're getting from Greg Allman and, and uh, uh, Trevor Sikma and Scott Reynolds and Mark Cook and Steve Isbis and Ira Kaufman and Rick Stratton. Like, you're, we're all hearing what's going on on the field. That's fine. Ren does a great job of taking us as fans, us as listeners, and placing us in the stands and seeing practice. Like audibly, though, you know, because because we're an audio podcast. Um, Mm. So it's it's uh, you know, I think that's part of what makes, you know, that whole piece different. So, um, you know, kudos to Ren for how he does that. Uh, To answer your question, though, I want to be clear about something because we've talked about Gerald on our show quite a bit. I think Gerald is a he's a good leader. He's I, I have I have kind of phrased him as a second chair leader. Which is, mm. it's still a leader. He's still leading. Uh, he's just not that out front guy. Um, yeah. He's, he's the guy who is, and you can see that when they're working. And, and Ren did a great job on our last episode of, of talking about that quite a bit as well with how he was interacting with Buckner um, and, and how he and Buckner would sit there and work together with something. And then Gerald would turn around and basically, you know, pull the other guys along like like that is leading that is that's a fantastic thing to do and yeah. those are the kinds of things that you really only get to see um you know if, if you get to go to training camp and unfortunately they don't see them every day so you have to be you know uh yeah you have to be there every day to catch the whole story of what's actually happening yeah and you know um it is it's hard it's obviously pretty much impossible to go to every single training camp unless it is your job um you know, us, like, you know, we're all fans. So, like, it's, you know, we have our other lives that we have to live. So it is kind of hard to go to all these training camps and kind of get that whole story. So I do appreciate, um, you know, you guys that you do on your podcast where you, you kind of are able to paint a more clear picture of what goes on in these types of practices and whatnot, you know. Um, I, I do I do like that. The next thing I do want to talk about, actually, is um. So we're we're kind of like what you were saying earlier, Brent. We're in like a very dark, dead period of the off season. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wanted to talk a little bit uh, because I asked some of my subscribers to submit topics, you know, and, you know, what we should just talk about. Us three should talk about. And they wanted to one of the main things that they wanted to talk about was cornerback battles. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, has there any have there been any cornerbacks that have um, impressed you guys just maybe in, in terms of like overall secondary for both of you because i know they just cut maurice fleming um he tore his shoulder labrum he's out for a while but have there been any like dark horses like you know like we already we all three know that there's going to be like big battles between like vernon hargraves the third mj stewart carlton davis um and at the safety position guys like chris conti keith tandy justin evans jordan whitehead um is there anybody who's kind of like coming up surprising you guys or is it kind of like that's been the main focus are those guys all battling each other well, two dark horses I would go with, uh, one at cornerback and one at safety. Uh, it's this kid, Rivers. Um, I don't have his first name with me. Um, I think it's um, David. Yeah, sounds right. Uh, you know, Coach Cutter's talked to him a little bit uh, about him sometimes after, uh, you know, mini camp or OTA practices. So he's flashed. Uh, I've seen, I've, you know, witnessed a couple of plays where it's like, oh, oh who's that guy? Um, and then at the safety position, 
Igwe Buike. I always want to call him Donald Igwe Buike because he was the Bucks kicker way back in the day, but this is like his cousin or nephew or something. Uh, mm. The Bucks, you know, they tend to do this. There's one guy they sort of break the bank for uh, as an undrafted free agent um, to get him in camp because they think he has a great chance of making the team. And uh, this year it was Igwe Buike. So uh, mm. those would be two guys to look for. Now, um, but you're right. Mostly what the battle is going to be, it's going to be who's going to take that outside corner spot mm-hmm. when Vernon moves in inside of the nickel. Because on both days that I went to minicamp, when all 90 players were there, that's exactly what happened. What they talked about during the offseason, Mike Smith said, well, you know, this is what we want to do with Vernon. You know, in a base defense, he starts outside. They bring in three wide. He moves in. When we were there day one, it was Carlton Davis the third was starting outside. Uh, you know, and he was playing press man coverage while on the opposite side, Brent Grimes was playing off a bit. Uh, but then when I went for day two, which ended up being the indoor practice, uh, Ryan Smith was the starting outside when they went to nickel package. So, uh, if you want to look like what's the big battle, I think that's going to be it. Uh, MJ Stewart flashed a little bit for me on the second day, but you know, he, I don't really know if that's enough sort of to unseat Vernon as the nickel. Um, so that's what we're going to have to see. But if you're looking for somebody to make a splash as far as the secondary, uh, Rivers and Igwe BK would be the guys that would, I would uh, keep an eye on who might unseat some of the, you know, like maybe Igwe BK makes it and they end up getting rid of Tandy. Uh, mm-hmm. Something like that could possibly happen. Now we're way, way, way far away from that. Yeah. But, uh, but as far as like, you know, lesser guys you may not have heard of. Those two guys have a, uh, you know, you can see him flash, and they've come up, you know, more than once. And in, in, uh, when talking to the coaches, Ren uh, James, I'm sorry, I don't mean to steal your show, but Ren, let me ask you a question that we've never <laughs> had a chance to talk about about this same subject. Fast forward a year, Brent Grimes's contract is is out, and he's not renewing uh-huh. again. Right, Vernon Hargraves, uh, M.J. Stewart, uh, I suppose is a nickel, and Carlton Davis, Carlton Davis, uh, uh, Ryan Smith. Vernon Hargraves and then MJ Stewart. Is that our is that our cornerback crew? You think next year? Yeah, yeah. You think? Yeah, mean, if you know if they don't draft or bring somebody in, type of deal. Yeah, we'll have to see how this year goes. But if you know if if none of these guys fall on their faces, uh-huh. you project sort of like the receiving core. Next year, project the receiving core. Well, we're not going to sign or keep Deshaun Jackson because he's too expensive. We got to sign Quam. We got to sign Alley. We got to mm-hmm. sign Donovan. We got to sign Jameis. So there's like $11 million. So you can see it being Evans, uh, Godwin, and uh, this new kid Watson possibly in the slot, you know, because Adam Humphrey is a free agent next year. Right. Same thing with the backs. Like, you know, you can see if you're just in what's in front of you, uh, you're probably looking at like a – I would – if I had to guess right now, I would think it would be Hargraves, Davis outside, mm-hmm. and then uh, – I'm not really sure. What, see, MJ Stewart's such a mystery right now yeah. because he's pretty exclusively a nickel corner. Right. So uh, does Vernon stay outside and he's learned enough where he can take over for the nickel? Or does MJ Stewart sort of just be this fourth nickel that is kind of a utility guy mm-hmm. and where Ryan Smith fits in? But at base defense, like you said, if we're going to fast forward, I, I would I would put my money on uh, a, a Hargraves uh, Davis uh, outside set right now. Yeah. Way, yeah, way I, early. I, I would agree with that too. You know, cause I remember this, I, I feel the Bucks have had a pretty good off season as well. Um, just kind of, a lot of people kind of criticize a handful of their moves, but, um, you know, especially kind of the secondary position, a lot of people feel like, Oh, we didn't do enough. Um, but I feel like they've kind of Jason light. I like what he did this year because he set us up for the future rather than, like really trying to gun hard to have us win now, you know, mm-hmm. like he could have very, he could have very easily um, had a situation where he just throws a ton of money. He ends up trying to get rid of a lot of bad contracts, I guess you could say, and just um, trying to do everything he can to win now. But he kind of, he did a really, I thought he did a really good job balancing it. And one of the, mm-hmm. one of the big things I loved about it was spending those two, second round draft picks on on the corners like what you were saying a few seconds ago Ren. it's like mj stewart's a big mystery but um you know to me and a, a lot of bucks fans i'm sure you guys have been hearing is like a lot of people like carlton davis you know he yeah mm-hmm. he he's definitely been getting like a lot of 
positive praise, not just from the fans, but also from the coaching staff as well. And he's, he's, he's showing that he can be like a a potential big corner for us later on down the line. So I I really like, you know, I think we all, I think we all three agree. It's like, you know, after Grimes leaves, he's he's pretty much a lock to leave after this season, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, Hargraves, Davis, Stewart um, are definitely going to be like our, at least, you know, our top three, you know, next season and whatever we decide to do with the cornerback position later on. Um, But that's what I liked so much about this off season so far is that, we won't be completely screwed. You know, a lot, a lot of people were saying, um, a lot of people earlier on in the off season were saying like, Oh, get rid of Hargraves. He's a bum. You know, he's, he's terrible. And I would sit there and I would think to myself, like, are you sure, you know, like, are you sure we want to do that? Cause that really, I don't know how that would work. Cause it would look really bad in terms of depth, you know? Um, yeah, that's stuff that I always ask when, you know, like Donovan Smith, he's terrible. Get rid of him. Okay. Replace him with who? You know, that's the question you have to Hargraves is terrible. Get rid of him. Okay. Replace him with who? Yeah. You know, it's like you have to sort of think it through. And, you know, and the salary cap, you know, comes in, in, into the situation as well. And, you know, the, I think the only reason Grimes doesn't come back next year is because the Bucks don't want to pay him $10 million. I'm right. sure if he can play, they'd love to have him back. But once again, you know, sort of like I, I talked about earlier, these contracts they need to extend – they're going to have to find money places. Now, remember, you know, we had like $90 million going into this offseason. It's all gone. Like, mm-hmm. it's all gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so there's no room to go, you know, oh, we should have got Patrick Peters or the, you know, the cornerback from uh, oh, the, the Chiefs. It's not Patrick Peters, is it? Marcus Peters. I don't know. He got, he got tra- Marcus Peters. Thank you. Yeah, he got traded or, or whatever. And it's like, we should go after him and done this. And then. You know, and now that it's finally over as far as the off season, you know, most of the, all the big moves, you look at it, it's like, oh, like you said, it's balanced. You know, there's 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 everyone set up for the future. I mean, there's not really a spot on the on the team right now where you can go, OK, you look at it. What's the plan for next year? Like, mm-hmm. it's already there. Like, why receivers there? Maybe the offensive line, you know. Especially yeah. the uh, right side, you could talk about Benenock and Dotson and Kappa and uh, uh, Wester and those guys. Uh, you know, Sweezy sort of comes into that mix. But besides, you know, the right side of the offensive line, it's just like they're set and they have depth. Like, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's Jason has done a really good job of improving this roster from yeah. four years ago. And and I'll tell you, I'm never a fan of judging a player after their second year of being in the league. Like full like to all. Oh, you know, Hargraves is a bum. Smith is a bum. Uh, the other Smith is a bum. The other Smith is a bum because we've got 18 different Smiths on this team. Like, let's give them to the end of their contract, you know, especially if you're in, you know, you have somebody playing cornerback in the defense that we had last year behind the line that we had last year. Like, uh, come on, man, that, uh, you know, let's let's wait and see how it plays out before I full on just go, oh, he's a bum. Let's get rid of him. The Roberto Aguayo thing. <laughs> Maybe we could have pulled the trigger on that one a little sooner than we did. <laughs> However, uh, in general, you know, the the idea of, you know, let's give them the run of that rookie contract before we actually judge them and, and look to get rid of them. I'm all for always trying to get the upgrade, but... You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to berate somebody after their second year in the league, especially a guy like Ryan Smith. I mean, you know, he's been a defensive snap his rookie year. Right. Didn't yeah. play, never stepped on the field as the, on, the, on the defense. Right. And he had a he had you know, he stepped in and beat out Hargraves for the for the spot on the outside last year and, you know, had a rough go of it. You know, let's make no bones about it. But who knows what's going to happen this year? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, speaking specifically on Hargraves, a lot of people are um, – last year he came on pretty strong as well, kind of like sw- switching back into the nickel. Uh-huh. You guys – and especially what Mike Smith has said recently, like what you guys were saying earlier about how they want to use him kind of in a hybrid role where playing him outside and playing him at nickel too. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that's something Hargraves can do? Because um, well, one thing that my subscribers were saying that they wanted us to talk about was kind of like Hargraves is – um, confidence improving in camp and whatnot. Do you guys think that he's like kind of suited for that kind of role of playing also outside and the nickel as well? Or do you feel more he's like, do you guys think he should just stay at like specifically nickel cornerback or specifically stay on the outside? Or do you think he can do both? 
I guess I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> well, uh, he, from what I've seen this year, and you know, sort of last year when he moved into the nickel, and uh, we he kind of gets an incomplete because he got hurt. Uh, he seems to be more comfortable on the inside. You know, I'm no NFL coach, so, you know, I don't break, I don't evaluate players and break them down. Uh, so I can't say, you know, well, his skill set because of this, you know, uh, correlates better to outside and does inside. He looks more comfortable inside. He makes more plays on the inside. I don't think his confidence has, uh, has waned uh, on the inside as it has on the outside. But then you can take it back to, when Grimes w- was hurt and then Vernon had to play the left side of the defense, probably had his best game ever as a defender as the left outside cornerback. Mm. Um, so it, it, like Brett said, it's hard to, you know, put these guys in a box only after two years. Uh, you know, you would like all of your players to come out like Lattimore for the saints last year. Oh, okay. Well, you know, defensive rookie of the year, you know, yeah. great player, but you know, you only get what you know, only gets one of those. Like most of the guys, especially like a defensive end, defensive tackle, cornerback, uh, those guys struggle. You know, high draft picks struggle, and they take a little longer. Now, I am not here to defend Vernon Hargraves on its play. All I'm saying is that we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but from what I've seen, I like Hargraves better in the nickel. Mm-hmm. Now, is Hargraves the second best outside corner? We'll find out, and we're going to find out pretty soon. Yeah. And then, um, Brent, I actually wanted to ask you, because a lot of people in the chat right now are saying, uh, I, I feel like every every time I do like a live stream, um, mo- a, a large portion of it is just so much hate for Mike Smith, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, Brent, do you feel a lot of that hate is like justified for the most part? Because I'll be honest, me personally, I – was not too impressed with what Mike Smith was doing last year, but you could also make the argument that he didn't have a good bit of pieces that he needed for his defense to work. Do you got, um, Brent, do you like what's going on with like Mike Smith? Do you feel that he um, deserves like an opportunity to have another full season or if he starts off bad, should we kind of can him mid season? Like what are, you, what are your thoughts on just Mike Smith in general and like how he runs his defense and whatnot? Cause he plays cornerbacks off, you know, he rotates safe. I hate rotating safeties, by the way. Um, he hates road, you know, he rotates safeties. He rotates defensive linemen, which kind of makes sense, but like all in all, how do you feel about like Mike Smith as just an overall defensive coordinator? Um, <laughs> and, and I know, I know that's a really loaded yeah. question. Cause and I mean, cause go. there's so many, there's so many <laughs> facets to that. Um, I will say this. I um, last season when we brought Mike Smith back, we mm-hmm. said on our show he is the best non free agent free agent signing that the Buccaneers had uh, because mm-hmm. you know we came off came off the back of that uh, five game win streak. You know we finally he finally had that winning season back in twenty sixteen. Sixteen is that right? Twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, but but let's face it, Mike Smith's defense for the first half of that year was was not good. And yeah. then it was great the second half of that year. And then all last year, we don't know what – we still don't know what happened last year. We don't – I mean, you know, bad chemistry, bad juju, bad whatever. We didn't really change a whole lot between 2016 and 2017 and personnel-wise. <laughs> it really was about the same team – couple of handful of people outside of that it was the same the coaching staff was the same uh you know the they only changed one coach on the defensive side of the ball so you know and and granted that coach is a pretty big deal it, it, you know and brinson buckner now on the d-line and getting rid of jay hayes uh mm-hmm. is that one change going to be the thing that sparks this this defense to to turn it around and do something and and still have Mike Smith in control. I don't know. I have set back with a policy this year of saying I'm I'm waiting to judge the offseason moves of this team. And by the way, I think that also probably includes the offseason non moves, meaning we're keeping the same guys and the same coaching staff until about week six of the season. That does not mean I'm not excited for this year. I am super excited for football. I am stoked and I am behind my team. Um, but I cannot sit here and say 
you know, with full confidence that Mike Smith is a defensive guru and he's a genius and I like exactly how he's running all of his defensive stuff. What I can sit back and say is he has a history of being really, really terrible. He also has a history of doing something pretty, pretty special. What are we going to get this year? I don't know. I I, yeah. I just mm. cautiously optimistic, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, okay. So to go back to the to the Vernon Hargraves thing. All right. So he's our second best outside guy. So we're going to play him outside, except for when we move to a nickel. He's a better nickel. So we're going to move him in and bring in the third guy for the outside. So now what you have is you have Vernon Hargraves, the guy who's coming off of a um, a down year. He's coming off of an injured year, and he's coming off of a year where he got pretty much beat up. Uh, and you're going to have him learn essentially two two positions. Like that's that's not doing him a favor by <laughs> leaving him in one spot and say learn this spot, master this spot. Because look, I okay, he's a first round pick. We're going to put him in a slot. Great, you don't draft a slot a slot corner in the first round. Everybody knows that. But at this point, we've already drafted him. If he's a better slot guy than he is an outside guy, then damn it, put him in the slot. I don't care, you know. Yeah. But yeah. there's no re you know. Uh, unless you just really have this thing that man Vernon's going to do something special and he, we're going to get him and, you know, kind of bounce him between these two positions. And that's going to be great. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's the best idea or not. I got to be honest with you. It seems kind of neat. I, I get the concept behind it. I'm with you on that. I don't like rotating my, my guys out a whole lot. You know, mm. I, I, I kinda, who's the, who was that old defensive coordinator we had or, or the defensive line guy we had uh, under Kiffin? Was it Mariucci? Is that who was? Uh, who was uh, like not Mariucci? Mary, no. Marianelli. Marianelli. Rod Marinelli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who basically like for Warren Sapp and, and those defensive line guys, like you have to die in order to come out of the game. <laughs> <laughs> that you know, and JPP is yeah. coming into this organization having played what was it ninety eight percent of the snaps? No, it wasn't. It was like ninety two percent of the snaps last year, and yeah. they're kind of like, well, you know, we rotate guys down here, and he's like, <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens. You know, like, <laughs> let our guys play. Let them yeah. freaking play. And I understand the idea of rotating. I, I don't know. I'm just an old school guy. You know, I, I like that. Let, as long as they're working, let them get in there and work, you know. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I You know, I, I answer your question by saying, I don't know. Uh, yeah. We'll wait well, till week no, six I, and see what's I, happening. We'll judge. I, I'll tell you this. I'm sorry. We'll tell you this. We will judge how he does come December of next year. That's fair. Maybe earlier. I, I don't yeah. think we should fire him mid season. I'm not a big fan of, of mid season changes. Um, you know, let him play it out and see what happens. Uh, Cause if we fired him halfway through the middle of his first year in 2016, we would have never had that great second half. Uh, That's true. Yeah, that's true. Ren, Ren, what do you think about it? About just the entirety of the situation with like Mike Smith and rotating players and whatnot. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, back to sort of what Brett said, uh, you know, echoing that, you know, no one, everyone was super ecstatic about bringing Mike Smith back before last year. Uh, he's a two time NFL coach of the year. Uh, he hasn't forgotten how to coach. You know, he's forgotten more football than I'll ever know. But his defense was terrible last year, you know, and, and it, you know, at, at the end of the day, it has to fall at his feet, uh, you know pick up one of a handful of statistics the Bucks were last in defensively. Uh, and it seemed like, once again, the big bugaboo was one of two things. One was communication, which I don't understand. It's like, is the defense written in Sanskrit? Or are our players just extra not smart? Or is your defense, like, trying to read, you know, Ulysses? It's just, it's just a bear. Uh, so, like, I... It's a make it or break it year for Mike Smith, I think, as a coach in his NFL career. Um, and I think through that urgency sort of ramped up. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't really have anyone I'd like to replace besides Mike Smith, except for maybe Wade Phillips. I think that Wade Phillips is the best defensive coach in football and has been in for has been for a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the players are hungry this year and they get it. It's almost like last year they kind of felt like you know oh we're the bucks everyone's picking us we can just you know sort of toss our helmet out on the field and we're gonna you know we're gonna win nine games this year watch us here we go and uh i don't want to say they didn't put in the work 
But, you know, I, like I said, I went to all the training camps. Like the passion I saw in day one and day two of minicamp uh, and sort of like the level of these guys are, are going at it, competing with each other, is not anywhere close to the level that was last year's training camp. And, I mean, it's ramped up this year. Um, I'm just hoping last year was just sort of an outlier for the entire organization, including, you know, the staff, uh, the coaching staff, the players, um, you know, somebody needed to sort of snap these guys out of it last year and it didn't happen. And now I think it it has, uh, I get the hate towards Mike Smith, but, um, you know, I, I'm sorry not sort of answer the question. I I think we'll wait and see. I think, the Bucks defense has to be better. And, you know, we're oh, going to yeah. find out real quick. These first, uh, like, five games, you know, uh, are tough ones. Like we got, you know, we got the Bears and then, like, all division winners, I think, in those first five yeah. games. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to find out real quick. Um, but I do like the direction it's going. I did like the on-field communication I saw at minicamp when they were running, you know, the 11 on 11s. Uh, I think that the arrow is trending up. But the bar was set so low last year, uh, yeah. it almost has to be trending up. <laughs> yeah. So, there's, yeah, there's I, basically nowhere else to go but up, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, make no bows about it. The way the season's going to go this year is going to ride on the shoulders of the defense. Like, mark my words. Oh, yeah. The defense is going to have to show up this year like they did in that five-game win streak. Like They're going to have to have a more consistent... Yeah, you're going to have one or two games where you're... What the hell happened there? Uh, I don't know. But you just sort of move on. But that needs to be more of the consistent play. And if it's not, then you know we're, you know, we're looking like 6-10 and 10 right in the face again. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I definitely feel at that point. You know, uh, things would definitely blow up for the coaching staff. Um, and speaking of that, um, yeah, a lot of people... Like what you just said, Ren... Um, you said that, you know, you couldn't really think of a, a replacement for Mike Smith besides like Wade Phillips. That'd be a great replacement. Um, a lot of fans feel that, like, you know, if things don't work out with Mike Smith, it's like, oh, well, Brunson Buckner's here. You know, the Cardinals players were saying on Twitter, this guy sh- is a future defensive yeah, coordinator. Forward. Yeah, I'm going to stop you right there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's exactly where they're getting their information. A couple of Cardinals players like him. He's going to be a defensive quarter next year. Okay, Mike Smith falters for the first couple of, uh, let's say, the Bucks go like, you know, one and three out the gate. Yeah. Fire Mike Smith. We'll just move Brenton Buck. Brenton Buckner knows absolutely nothing about de- being a defensive coordinator. I don't even know if he has his own defense. Does he have like? Does he have a scheme? Does it, you know? He doesn't. Mm-hmm. He's not there yet. Yeah, he you know possibly can he be sure, but just because a couple of players like him, like you can't take that and be like, okay, here's the next one. It's it's just. So much more goes into it. You don't know where he is as far as development of coach and, and even of his overall scheme of defense and what he likes to run and what's he, you know, how is he going to preach it? How is he going to teach it? How is he going to learn it? It's a lot easier teaching. You know, when I was there, yeah, he's in charge of the defensive line, but Brenton Buckner was just with the defensive tackles. Mm-hmm. So really, his hands-on with, with, with like, was like six, seven guys. Now you got to expand that to 45 guys during training camp, sometimes 48 around there. So this, you know, this talk where, oh, if Mike Smith falters, would have slide Brenton Buckner in? You have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what kind of defensive coordinator is going to be. What? Because Tyron Matthews said that he'd be a good defensive coordinator. That's what you're hanging your, your hat on? Like, <laughs> hey, like, hey, Tyron Matthews says he'd be a good defensive coordinator. Come on, Jason Light. Get off your butt. Do the right thing. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, Red, but oh Red, but Red, I will, I will tell you that <laughs> storyline will make a fantastic movie one day. <laughs> Great, it's it's a good Hollywood oh plot point. Gosh. That's what it Red. is, and that's why it's sexy. That's why people love it. Because I, because I, I did the same thing when Brinson Buckner came in, and you start listening, and you're like, man, I like this guy. Yeah, this is. Oh, is it? Po- I mean, hell, I even sat there and went, is it possible if Dirk Cutter sucks this thing up that he just hired his replacement? I, I skipped Mike Smith and I said Dirk Cutter. Now I said that in the back of my head. I did Brenton not say Buckner it for president. <laughs> I did not say it into this microphone until right now. So okay. I'm not saying that that's what we should do because Ren is a hundred percent right. He's not. He's not there yet. Maybe he. I don't know. Maybe he is. Maybe he's got some of that. But we can't judge him because he goes out and he yells at Gerald McCoy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. He's just and that's and it's this it's this reason why people like Carlton Davis, you know, are are 
defensive backfield was not very good. What would they all have in common? They're all short. They're not that big. What is Carlton Davis? He's six one, like two ten. As soon as you were drafted, everyone's like, finally, he became like, you know, he, he was like, okay, this is the guy. And for the very short amount of period that he's been there, he has backed it up, which is nice. It's the same thing with, with like Brinson Buckner. It's like, why do they like him? Because he's the exact opposite of Jay Hayes, whose defensive line was terrible. He's just he's just not Jay Hayes right now. Mm-hmm. You have yeah. no idea how the defensive line is going to do. <laughs> you have no idea if they're even going to take to this coach. You have no idea what you're talking about, right. and you're putting this guy on the dollar bill. Stop it. It's it, Listen, guys, <laughs> we've already made this mistake once. His name was Raheem Morris. Right? Oh no, that was a money move. Ooh. That was a Glazers like not wanting to <laughs> right. pay anybody. No, no, but you took, you took <laughs> a guy who was highly unqualified and skipped him a couple of steps and put him in there. Yeah. Now, listen, <laughs> I, I, listen, I would love to see Brinson Buckner go on and become a defensive coordinator and possibly even a head coach one day in the NFL. That would be fantastic. Will it be with the Bucks? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Is it going to happen this season if Mike Smith falters and Dirk Cutter falters? We're going to jump him up there? No. But, no. you know, I'm glad to watch him, you know, go along that process to become that and turn into that. But, you know, to look for it this year, uh, unless it's something really special and, and seriously, we're going to make a movie about this one day. Not looking for it to happen. Ren, um, that is the most fired up I think anybody has ever been on this channel ever. And I appreciate that so oh, much. You're welcome. Go back that and listen was... to some of the prior Peter Katz episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that. Um, that was, you know that <laughs> that that leads me to what I was going to say about it was um for for Brenton Buckner. A lot of people say that like you know he he was the best one of the best, if not the best moves of this off season. Um, and this is kind of a question for both of you guys. Um, Brent, you can start. Do you guys kind of feel like? Buckner is having as big of an impact as a lot of people have said he's supposedly having, or do you feel it's kind of like he's just a defensive line coach? Like a lot of people are saying like, he's going to be the reason that we're going to have a 10, you know, a dominant defensive line. He's going to be the reason the Bucks are finally going to have their first 10 sack player since back in 2005 with Simeon Rice. Do you guys kind of feel that's more so the case, or do you feel it's kind of like it's just the player's raw talent over Buckner's ability to coach? Or do you feel that like, Buckner is going to be the reason why these this defensive line is if it is is if the Buckner's defensive line is 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 dominant. Do you feel Buckner's going to be the reason, or just the fact that we or the play? Yeah, essentially like that. My answer is yes, all of it. Yeah, like okay, like it, it, it's <laughs> um, next question. Yeah, like no, I mean Buckner. Buckner is having a huge impact. Make make no mistake about it. Watching him. Uh, seeing what he's doing out there on the field, uh, you know, Ren talked about it earlier, and, and I'll 100% back it up. You got there to camp, you got there to, to the building, and in fact, I was just talking to a guy yesterday. He called me, and I said, uh, and he's oh, he's my ticket guy, you know, and I said, I said, hey, Bill, just out of curiosity, what's the feeling there in the building from your side? You're you're in ticket sales, you know, and he's like, man, I got to tell you, it's so different from last year. Like even in our office, the the feel, the air of everything is so different. Is that because of Brunson Buckner? I don't know if it's because of him, but he is certainly a part of that, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. But the other side of it's true. You still have to have the horses. You still got to have the guys that are that are able to do it. You got to have somebody who knows how to harness them. It, it's it, you know we talk about in the draft that there's this magic algorithm of team need versus best player available, and where those two things intersect, that's who you draft. It. When you talk about success of the D-line, it's it's this magic thing between the way the coaches are coaching and how they're putting their players into position versus the actual talent of the players. Uh, bad news bears, the the <laughs> cool running stories, those things are few and far between. Where you take somebody, you know, you take somebody who really has no talent, and they ha- the Mighty Ducks, they, and they they happen to win because they go back to basics or something like that. No, you've got to have some talent to get out there and actually play with the best. Uh, so it yes, it is the players. Yes, I do think Brinson Buckner is having a huge impact. Uh, is it one over the other? I don't know. I think it's just some weird amalgam of both. Yeah. He is hard not to watch coach. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. it's just it's just something that you notice him out there, you see him working, you feels like he's the most intense coach. It feels like that the players, his players are paying the most attention to him 
it feels like he's getting the most done uh, when all the position drills are going on. Now, is that fair or unfair? I don't care. I'm telling you the way it looks and, and how it feels. Uh, now, is he the reason we're going to get 10 sacks? Maybe. I think it's more going to come down to talent. Um, you know, from what Jason Light brought in. Uh, but I, I sort of echo, now want to echo what Brett said. Like, he's definitely a part of it. Um, mm-hmm. And if, you know, the Bucks do get a, you know, 10, and like Brent Buckner said in one of the interviews, like, I don't care about 10 sacks. Like, I want wins. And he's right. And I think Buck fans would, would be happy too if the Bucks go 11 and 5, make the playoffs, and, you know, somebody, the highest sack total is eight. I don't think I'm really going to care. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's like we just we we want to get into the playoffs. That's sort of like that's the, the sort of the next step for Buck fans. It's like I don't care what the record is. I don't care how we win the games. I don't care. I, I, I don't care who's playing at what position at what time. And I, I just I just want us to get into the playoffs. So uh, Buckner. Yeah. Uh, if that will he deserve some of the accolades that comes his way with winning? Absolutely. Is he the reason for it? Yeah, I, I he's, got a, he's you know he's a percentage you know he's not the head coach you know he's not the defensive coordinator he's just a defensive line coach but he's fun to watch coach yeah. he really and, is and, and I mean you know and Ren to to go with your point you you still have to look at the at the talent of the team James for mm-hmm. what, for what you were saying because mm-hmm. I mean think about the guys we had last year outside of the starting guys we're talking Silver Salinga Ryan Russell. Uh, hell, Will Clark, I think Will Clark became a well, starter. Yeah, you Will had, Clark was a starter. Uh, Channing Ward bounced around and in, 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 you know in there quite a bit. I mean, th- these are guys that we have, uh, and nothing against those guys, we have so solidly upgraded that this defensive line. We we have two starting caliber defensive lines, at least it seems to me, like ready to go as our entire defensive line. You know, yeah. so, and besides that, sorry, real quick, yeah, go ahead. all those people that that are no longer on the team. Uh, on the defensive line, besides Clinton McDonald, none of them have jobs. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a true point. Um, you know, I, I think people, when you really go back and you look back uh, back at it, our defensive line was just so so bad. You know, obviously last last in sacks last year. I mean, kudos to Jason Jason Light for just going out and getting the pieces to try and improve. You know, Vinny Curry they signed to a big contract. Um, swapped him for Robert Ayers, essentially, you know, and trading for Jason Peter Paul. Um, I think as Bucks fans, you know, getting eight and a half sacks, you know, if JPP got eight and a half sacks, you know, it's like, like what you guys were saying earlier, it's like, as long as we win, who cares if we get 10 sack guy or, you know, who, you know, what doesn't matter. I think at this point, we're just kind of sitting here thinking like, please just win, you know, yeah. like, please. Yeah. That's all, that's all we want, you know. Um, but at, um, switching over to the offensive side, actually. So, you know, Jason, uh, James Winston and Deshaun Jackson have been trying to kind of build their chemistry this year after a poor season last year where Jackson only put up, I believe it was 700 yards and um, only a few touchdowns. Just from your guys' um, opinions, do you feel that this kind of um, – do you feel that there has been chemistry growing between the two or do you feel it's just kind of something – because I, I know a lot of fans, especially lately, have been kind of clamoring for like a maybe a Deshaun Jackson trade. Do you feel that that should happen or do you feel it's like, no, Deshaun Jackson's a playmaker. He should be on this team because he can contribute very well to this offense. And that chemistry with James Winston is growing. Like what do you guys feel about that kind of situation? And um, um, Red Wing, start with you. Sure. Uh, well, I don't think Deshaun Jackson should be traded. Uh mm-hmm. Something that Brent likes to say, and I'm going to steal from it because I got, I got to go first, is uh, everybody <laughs> has a price. You know, if stupid comes knocking, uh, you know, answer the door. You know, if somebody wants to give, you know, say the Saints come knocking and they go, hey, we will give you Lattimore, our defensive rookie of the year, you know, who still has four years under his rookie contract for Deshaun Jackson. Will you take it? Well, yeah, I will. You know why? <laughs> because I got Hump. I got Godwin. And, you know, Jason Knight really likes this Watson's kid at a pen. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, you know, that's our deepest spot. Uh, now, do I think we should trade Deshaun Jackson? I mean, why? Like, why should we trade Deshaun Jackson? Because you don't have chemistry with Jameis? Uh, you know, one thing they're doing this year uh, that a lot of people were clamoring for last year, and, you, you know, you could see it in OTAs, and I definitely saw it at minicamp, was they're putting Deshaun Jackson in the slot. 
You know, they're they're putting him at different places to get the ball instead of just having him run these nine routes all day long and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, completing one out of ten. Uh, they're finding creative more ways to get his hand, you know, get the ball in his hands and, and use his speed. So uh, I like Deshaun Jackson on this team for this year. You know, if Stupid comes knocking, answer the door. Uh, but I think I, I fall into the camp of, of next year. Uh, no matter what he does, I think Jason Light is sort of set up for the future without Deshaun Jackson in 2019. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Yeah, I, no, I mean, that's it's spot on. If stupid comes knocking, you got to answer the door. But no, th- we have no reason to trade him. He is clearly the the number two best playmaker that we have on this team. You don't you don't get rid of that guy on purpose. You know, somebody's got to give you a really sweet deal uh, to make that happen. It, you know, where he's set up, he's well with the team. It, you know, I said last year that I thought he and Jameis, I wanted to see that earlier in the year. I wanted to see them go during their off days and, and be throwing balls and, and doing some extra stuff. And I understand why that can't happen once you get into the season. Uh, but, you know, we've seen the videos and we, we've heard the reports of uh, Deshaun and Jameis getting out there and working on it. Is it going to come to fruition on the football field? Well, we won't know until the season gets here. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, again, this is this is that whole like I'm waiting and seeing till week six. Like we got to we got to wait and see. We got to see what happens when they get out there. Maybe they they've developed this amazing chemistry all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, they have one year under their belt. One year and Jameis was hurt for Ren, what was it? At least 6 games of it and then sat out for 3 more or something like that. I think like he that? was out I think he was out for 23 games last year. It <laughs> seemed like it. Yeah. Uh yeah. So, you know, in 16 practices. Uh you know, it just <laughs> Uh, so we'll, I mean, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll see if the work that Jameis and Deshaun have put in bears fruit come the season. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and if it doesn't, then, you know, Deshaun will probably not be here next year just because of the way the contract has worked and what we need to do. So, you know, but I'm not looking to trade him unless stupid comes knocking and, you know, if we get a really sweet deal out of it, I'm for it, you know? Yeah. And then, um, Oh, okay. Sorry, I sort of right. want to sort of put a button on this. Uh, you know, Deshaun Jackson, James, first off, Jameis Winston doesn't really build chemistry that easy. I think it was more of, a, of an anomaly with Mike Evans, you know, Jameis's rookie year that they hooked up so early. Him and Karen Brait work after practice every single practice. Every single practice I've been there, Jameis and Cam Newton throw the ball for like an extra 20 minutes. That's I mean, why Cam that Bray. chemistry is there. Cam Who Bray. am I saying? Cam Newton. He is not throwing yeah. balls with Cam Newton after practice. That that would be a sight to see, though. Did you, did you see that Cam Newton video? That kid's like, he's like, I'm going to do it. And he gets in his face. He's like, you're going to do what? He's like, nothing. <laughs> um, anyway. Anyway, yeah. So Cameron Bray, not Cam Newton. Uh, I don't think he's a tight end. So, uh, but once, and this is sort of the frustration I think Buck fans feel with Dirk Cutter and Mike Smith. Once you felt like as a fan, you're watching them not connect time after time after time after time on these deep balls. It's time to change it up. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. OK, you as coaches, it now it becomes on you to get him the ball, to get uh, Deshaun Jackson the ball another way. Uh, and so they're slow to change. You know, and I think that was a lot of frustration as last year about the play calling and the, and the defensive scheme where it felt like. Uh, fans thought that the you know Dirk Cutter and Mike Smith weren't just changing like they weren't trying to fix the problem. Obviously they were, but now uh, a year in and you can and I don't know if it's Todd Munkin's influence with the offense about you know Deshaun moving to slot or it was a reevaluation with Jason Light and they all sat down, all the coaches sat down and said, okay, this is what we need to do. Uh, but changes is coming. So as far even if. Jameis and Deshaun Jackson chemistry on the deep ball doesn't get any better this year. It falls on the coaches to get Deshaun Jackson the ball where he could be dangerous. Mm-hmm. I gotcha. That's yeah. I pretty much agree with most of that. Um, and if uh, kind of for the for our next topic here, you know, we've t- we've just talked about all the coaches, kind of players and stuff like that. Um, kind of moving on then to the front office aspect of it. Um, a lot of people praised Jason Light for this past offseason. You know, he he did a lot. And like what we said earlier, he had a very balanced offseason. I thought he took care of a, a, a very good amount of problems that the Bucks had um, from this past season. Do you guys 
and this is kind of like a two parter here and um Brian we can start with you um is um <clears throat> do you guys like what Jason Light did this off season and more specifically what was your favorite move what was your least favorite move and then what's one move you would have done yourself this past off season and then Brent will start with you yeah I, I hate to sound like a broken record I'm waiting till week six to judge the off season moves yeah okay yeah uh, now that being yeah. said that being said, uh, I think my favorite move was his draft, where we went into the draft. We had a first rounder. We had a second rounder. No third rounder. He traded that one first round pick and picked up three. It turned it into turned it into three second rounds and two or and a, and a third round pick. Like that is that is amazing. The movie Draft Day didn't have a draft move as good as what Jason Light pulled there. <laughs> You know, and yeah. uh, it, it, it that to me is it was my favorite thing that I watched him do uh, by trading down just a couple of spots. You know, he picks up those two extra ones and then he trades and then he later trades one of those extra ones that he has uh, and picks up another one plus that third round like it, it, or a fourth rounder and then trades that back. And it, I mean, it was it was it was it was gold. It was amazing to watch, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that was my favorite move. Uh, what were your other questions? Least so what, favorite, uh, least and favorite, and then what's well, something you would have done yourself? Uh, I think my least favorite was, um, oh, if if it's signing Chandler Canzaro, that's okay. Like, no, no, it's not I understand. that. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I kind of wanted to see him bring Pat Murray back, but I understand why not. Um, mm-hmm. Like, like. I mean, this would make our friend Craig in Vegas super happy. Uh, I don't understand how <laughs> I don't understand how Jay Hayes was the only coach who got fired this year. I knew it. I, I, I just don't. Um, I don't get that. Uh, bringing in Brinson Buckner, amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, but you What's know his name. I can't remember. You're talking about special teams coach, right? No, I'm talking any of them. I I don't understand uh, how Brinson Buckner is the only the 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 only new guy. Yeah, the only new guy. Now I understand. You know, we moved Todd Munkin over to the full time offensive coordinator, which should have been, and Skylar Fulton moved over, and there was a couple of other little minor moves. But like, I I just don't understand why that's the only coaching move coming out of last year that we made. Outside of just the idea of kind of Ren's whole point that he pointed out earlier of, okay, and who are you going to replace him with? Who is there? Maybe there wasn't a better person to replace him with, uh, you know, and may, I, I, you know, this is where I want those hard knocks cameras or the, the all or nothing cameras in there, because I want to see those conversations where, you know, Jason light and Dirk cutter are sitting down evaluating the coaches. You yeah. Know, I like, I, I'm just curious. I want to know what they were talking about. So, um, so that's a move that I, I wasn't a super fan of. I wanted to see more, uh, and, and I don't know, I, I, again, I'm waiting till week six to, till week six to judge it, but you know, scratching my head. I don't know. Um, uh, you know, maybe a little bit re-signing Charles Sims cause I thought he was gone. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you can't take two. Sorry. You only sorry. have one. Move uh, on. And what's, to the next and what's one that, question. what's one that I would have done? Um, yeah. I probably, I, I I don't know what it would have taken, but I really wanted Quentin Nelson, and I would I have too. done what we needed to do to trade up to get him. That's yeah. I I don't know what that would have taken, and I wouldn't do stupid for it. Uh, but if I yeah. could reasonably do Quentin Nelson, I would I would have traded to get to get him. I love Quentin oh, Nelson so right. <laughs> and then Ren, what about you, Mike? Uh, so uh, yeah, no, go ahead. So, uh, like, same thing for Bren. What was your favorite move for Jason Light? Least favorite move, and then what would you have done differently? And just kind of your overall thoughts on how Jason Light approached this offseason and just kind of what he did this offseason. Sure. I think my favorite move, uh, there were so many. I mean, you know, with the whole revamping of the defensive line, bringing, you know, Jensen at center. Uh, so I guess my favorite, because those are sort of hard to – you can't really gauge those yet. Those guys haven't played a down for us yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's going to have to be locking up Mike Evans uh, mm-hmm. during the off season. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Something that you know he no longer has to worry about, and he'll be a buck for a long time. And I think everyone's happy about that. Uh, you know, he, by the end of this year, and definitely by the end of next year, he'll probably have all of the major receiving records as a Buccaneer. Uh, you yeah. know, and he'll be like 25 years old. Um, then I guess the move I, I the least favorite was mm-hmm. I was going to say Charles Sims. That's why I got mad at Brent when he brought it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I, it's not that I dislike Charles Sims, but I understand why he was there. They brought him in right before, day before the draft to give them flexibility. You know, uh, they kind of knew what they were doing in the first round. Um, they knew it wasn't going to be a running back, you know, on their board. You know, there's no way Sean Barkley was going to drop to him. So they were probably thinking logically like it was going to be Vea or, or Derwin James. Uh, so they brought Charles Sims in just in case something weird and funky happened in the second round. Uh, where they didn't get, you know, their their top choices of running back. Uh, so you had something to fall back on. Um, like Brett said, he, you know, uh, I like Charles Sim in space. I just don't know right now, especially last year, that, that the that the team is creative enough to get him the ball where it needs to be for him to be effective on the offense. Um, I don't care that every time he's in the game, they throw him the ball. Like it's going to be a pass. I don't care. Like execute the play you know uh, i said this a few times uh on our pod when this sort of subject has come up it's like i don't remember when the patriots came back and beat the falcons in that super bowl i don't remember the patriots running the ball the whole second half of the game mm-hmm. you know and everybody knew it but you, you they just executed so i really don't have a problem with that uh i just kind of uh i just i i thought it was something that was just sort of a bad taste in the mouth um, you know, Charles Sims has had one good year and he's had three substandard years, in my opinion. Um, but now he's back and if they could figure out how to use him, okay. And the move I would have made, uh, God, uh, what, what I would have, done. I probably would have found, oh, I would have gone and got a safety this off season. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's still a lot of them out there. Oh yeah, Trey, uh, Trey Boston, Eric Reed. You thank know. you. Yep, exactly. Vicaro, you know, there's still some names out there. Exactly, and I, I, I that would be the one I would make is, is get. Uh, I like Vicaro the best out of those three, uh, mm-hmm. followed by Reed, then Boston. Um, so that would be probably be something that that. If I was GM, I'd be taking a serious look at, and, and probably would have pulled the trigger on by now. Now. If you've listened to the Peter cast and ha- had heard Brett and I ever talk about uh, Jason Light, we're big fans of him. Um, I wrote an article last year uh, at the beginning of training camp how Jason Light had flipped over the roster by 93 um, yeah. percent. And that was at the beginning of training camp. And that was like just in like three years, I think. Uh, and if O.J. Howard and it was something like uh, like nine or 18 out of 22 starters, not in counting, not including kickers and punters. Uh and if like OJ Howard ended up starting halfway through the year, then it would have bumped it up like uh and I think I think I think through Nick McNichols in there too. Whoops. Uh it would have bumped it up to like twenty out of twenty two starters in three years. So I think I any failures as the Buccaneers as a whole organization, uh as that equates to wins on the field, if you start going down the list whose fault it is, I think Jason Light is the last name on that list. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And then last topic, this one, I'm sure you guys are probably really, really, really tired of hearing about it. And, um, Ren, we'll start with you. It's about the Jameis Winston Uber incident. Oh. So, okay. So, obviously, this situation has – it's it's been in the back of Bucks fans' mind pretty much the entire off season, you know, and nobody at this point really knows what's going to happen. Um. One, I guess you should like, and it's obviously it's it's really hard to call like kind of a situation of like, oh, is he going to get suspended? Is he going to get suspended? Nobody knows. Um, my question to both you guys and Ren, we can start with you. Is let's say obviously the worst case scenario, let's say Jameis gets suspended from one to four games, you know, and at maximum four games. Let's just assume that's the worst of the worst scenarios. Do you feel that that season, you know, a season breaking? Um, punishment for the Buccaneers where it's like without Jameis Winston we can't go out there and win these neck these first four games or do you kind of feel that 
you know, if it's Bucks fans' worst nightmare, James Winston's out the first four games of the year. Do you feel Ryan Fitzpatrick can come in and still keep our hopes alive? Because, you know, last year he ended up going two and one when Seamus Winston did finally sit out for a couple of games mm-hmm. um, due to his shoulder injury. Do you guys trust Ryan Fitzpatrick as a backup, or do you feel that they should maybe try and bring in somebody else, or even give Ryan Griffin an opportunity? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, <laughs> I will start with, I don't care who's the quarterback for the team. Uh, these first four games, it's all going to fall on the defensive shoulders. Uh, you know, I don't think these teams are going to come out and probably put points up. I'm talking about Pittsburgh, Philly, uh, uh, New Orleans. Uh, these guys are going to put points up. So the defense are going to have to, you know, I'm looking like they keep it around 24 points. I, I feel like they've done their job. This is how high powered these offenses are. Uh, and I don't really think it matters who's quarterback, either Jansen Winston or Ryan says Patrick. If the defense doesn't show up, the Bucks could go one and three. It doesn't matter who's at the quarterback. Now, do I trust Ryan Fitzpatrick? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I've also said many times and Brent as well, you know, on the pod that Ryan Fitzpatrick looked awful in training camp i mean Mm -hmm. awful uh ryan griffin looked so much better and if and if you took like draft picks out of it and who they were and took all their names off the back of their jerseys you know and you watched Jameis fitzpatrick and ryan griffin run the offense ryan griffin looked the best Mm -hmm. of the three last year during training camp i mean and it really wasn't that close It, it really wasn't now we've talked to you know Trevor Sikkim from Pewter Report since then, and he brought up a good point. He's like Ryan Griffiths is not really a guy that can drive the ball downfield uh, like Jameis can. You know, in Dirk Cutter's vertical offense, you know Jameis takes you know takes a drop back, put his foot in his ground, and he can drive the ball down the field forty yards, you know, on a rope, and that's where he excels. Uh, you know, when he starts to get air under the ball, that's you know where his percentages start to drop off. Um, but do I think Ryan? I think Ryan Fitzpatrick can can win those games. Yeah, I do. Uh, do I trust him? Yeah, because from what I saw, when he he gets in there, he gets it. He's a vet. You know, he's going to do some rive. You know, you know, rive vet things to keep us in the game, and he's not going to lose the game for us. That's for sure. Uh, and then, um, what was the final part of it? Um. Oh, of the of the off season situation, kind of like that. Oh, about like. The how do I feel about the Uber thing altogether? Yeah, just kind of what I guess if you had to give your own specific opinion, what do you feel is going to happen? Oh, geez, I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, I, I don't. Um, I think he'll probably get some type of punishment because the language in uh, the collective bargaining agreement about, you know, uh, hurting the shield, bruising the shield, uh, the NFL shield, it's bad for the label, it's bad for the brand. Uh, mm-hmm. That that language is so vague that Roger Kandel can pretty much do whatever he wants. And I think that falls on the players association. I mean, as a union, you know, it's your job to protect your members and letting that type of language go through and let one person, you know, and you don't even like your side doesn't even get a, doesn't even get a voice in it. Just letting one person who's not on your side decide to take players off the field and basically it takes away paychecks uh, is is an absolute failure as an institution, as a union actually exists. Like it was it is the biggest like, you know, fumble that the players union I can remember has ever done. Now, what's going to happen? Who knows? You know, and who to blame? Who knows? There's concrete evidence. It's Jameis's fault. If it's bruised the shield, it's the players association's fault. Mm hmm. But uh, I, I honestly uh, – do I think we have a better chance to win these games um, with Jameis and Ryan Fitzpatrick? Yes, absolutely. But once again, I hate to sound like a broken record. If this new defense doesn't show up, I don't care who's playing quarterback. You're yeah. not going to win. That's true. And um, Brent, same, same kind of – yeah, no, I mean, I'll piggyback off what was, what Ren was just saying. I'll kind of work backwards through your questions. Um, mm. You know, to me, uh, I, I don't know. The question of what will happen versus what should happen are two very, very different questions in this situation. Yeah. And what I think yeah. should happen is nothing. 
because what you're setting up a precedent for is anyone can accuse any NFL player, and all of a sudden that NFL player, well, I don't want to say snap because it's taken so dang long, but all of a sudden any NFL player is is suspended because it bruised the shield, because somebody else just said, hey, this guy did this thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you could say, well, because Jameis didn't report it to the team or blah, 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 or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Ren's right. It's so vague. The link, you know, and, and when we went into the locker room, Ren, there, they have the player conduct policy written on the wall and you mm-hmm. can see it plain as day. It's it's so incredibly vague. Um, so, you know, I I will just say, like, be a good person. Like, <laughs> right. at that. and hope That's... nobody t- says anything bad about you. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it really it, it's yeah. It, it, so I don't think anything should happen because I I just you can't prove it one way or the other. You, it's his word versus hers, you know. Um, so yeah, I just I don't know. I I yeah, I don't. And it might be a little bit because he's my guy. You know, Jameis is my quarterback. So you yeah. know, maybe I'm a little bit biased, and and I I don't make any apologies for that. Um, you know, I got to tell you this when I was at. Uh, mini camp last week was it last week, Ren? I think it was last week. Um, looking at Griffin, Fitzpatrick, and Jameis all together, like just looking at their body type and how they were uh, holding themselves, and and you know their physical musculature, and you know just visually the eye test. I thought Ryan Griffin looked the most like an NFL quarterback out of the three of them. I really did. Mm-hmm. Um, he and, looked the most Bo Allen esque. <laughs> Um, you know, so, but is, is Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, going to, if you got to go into a game, I'm going to take the guy who's a veteran who has experience over the guy who looks the part, you know, <laughs> has never um, taken an NFL and who's, snap. who's never dressed for an NFL <laughs> game. I still think that that's true. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he's never actually worn an NFL uniform during a game. Uh, put on pads during a game. I, That's crazy. It's crazy. When you, and we've kept him on the roster this whole time. Um, <laughs> but I really want to see Ryan Ryan Griffin go. I want to see what he can do. Yeah. You know? And there was enough evidence to me from last year until Ren's favorite player. Cole Gardner. Uh, you know, <laughs> messed up and, and let Griffin get hurt. And Cole Gardner, for whatever reason, is back on the team this year. So, yeah, it's, Griffin, it's so <laughs> It's it's so weird with Ryan Griffin because like everybody, especially this past off season, has kind of has kind of had this mindset of what what's going on with Ryan Griffin? Why he hasn't done anything for us since we brought him in? Yeah, you know, and I I just think it's kind of like he hasn't had the opportunity. Yeah, obviously the coaching staff sees something in him, otherwise they wouldn't have kept him for so long. You yeah. know, I um, I do believe this. I believe one hundred percent. Had he not gotten hurt last year during the the preseason game. Ryan Fitzpatrick would have been cut from the team and Griffin would have been our backup quarterback last year. Yeah. I, I have yeah. no doubt in my mind that that's what would have happened. It was yeah. definitely trending that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, just kind of the last part of that question, Brent, um, if obviously yeah. we have no idea what's going to happen, but if Jameis does get suspended on um, would you prefer, like, do you trust Ryan Fitzpatrick to go out there and win games or are you kind yeah. of saying with Ren, it's like defense, if the defense doesn't show up, then none of this matter will matter, you know? Both. I I 100% agree with Ren. If defense doesn't show up, then, you know, suck. Uh, it's it's not going to be good. <laughs> uh, but I yeah. do trust Ryan Fitzpatrick uh, to go out there and, as Ren said, not lose the game. I will, I will never forget being in Raymond James Stadium last year when Ryan Fitzpatrick came onto the field uh, d- during an injury situation. And there was just this weird calm throughout the stadium. Like it, it just, it's like, he's got it. He's fine. He'll be, it'll be okay. Um, you know, the, like that's what Ryan Fitzpatrick brought to the table. And uh, you heard that kind of echoed from the players. You heard that echoed from the coaching staff. I heard that echoed from various podcasts. There was just this, he just put you at ease. And, you know, yes, I'll take that. And can we win? Listen, there's enough talent around the quarterback that you can have that 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 guy who's just a game manager. You know, he doesn't have to be a special talent. He can be a mediocre quarterback as long as he doesn't lose you the game. There's enough talent around around the quarterback that if everybody shows up, 
we can win games. And damn it, I think we can beat the Eagles, and I think we can beat the Steelers. And I, you know, there's not a game on this oh, yeah. schedule as hard as it is. There's not a game that we can't win. No, we can like, win uh, every single one of these games. We could go 16 and 0 this season. I'm not saying that we will, and I don't it, think we will. But it's it's but, <laughs> I'm not saying that as a prediction. Whoa, but, what just happened? But <laughs> but <laughs> we can beat every single team that's on our schedule this year. Yeah, I mean, whenever the schedule first came out, I remember I made a video talking about it, and everybody everybody's been freaking out about the first three games. You know, we we play the Saints, and then we play the Eagles, and then we play the Steelers. And Monday Night Football, it's like we're screwed. It's like, well, no, technically, you know, we can win any of these games. You know, mm-hmm. never never think that the Bucks can't win any of these games. You just have to be have a mindset of more like, okay, it's possible because it is, it's possible. You know. Right. Um, so you just really have to just change the mentality in that kind of way. But anyway, Ren, Brent, thank you guys so much for being on. First time ever doing a show with you guys. You know, thank you so much for coming on and just being a part of this. Um, for everybody who's still watching the live stream right now, all 26 of you guys, if you want to go check out the podcast, the link to that will be down in the description below, as well as links to the PeterCast YouTube channel, as well as the Twitters of the PeterCast and Brent and Ren's personal Twitter accounts as well. So if you guys want to go follow all of those, be greatly appreciated. Um, Ren, Brent, do you guys have any final words before we go ahead and close out this live stream? Um, just overall? No, Brent, Ren, go how about you? Go Bucks, go right? Bucks. All right. So- oh, no, sorry. I was waiting for Brent to go. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I always like to wrap things yeah, up. You sorry, say it, a bit long win- long, long-winded. Um, <laughs> oh, I have to say it? Okay, I'll say it. it to the end. You have to All say right, it. I'll save it for the end. You can calm down. Say it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think it's exciting. I mean, no, we're right in the dark. Like, you know, we've, we've said a few, we were in the dark days of NFL football, but it, it's exciting. Uh, you can definitely feel if you're a Bucks fan out there and you're watching this, you can feel, uh, it's not desperation. It's competition. It's like, they're getting after it. Uh, it's a totally different feel. Like Brent's ticket guy said, I mean, it's, it's almost like they've got this, they're a little angry. They got a chip on their shoulder. Like, like we really screwed the pooch last year. And um, the guys that that Jason Light went out to get, you heard about it, you know, a hundred times, grit, tenacity, win at all costs type of guys. Uh, it is a different feeling, and I think it's something to get excited about. Uh, are they going to go sixteen or no? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but, but it's oh, no. it's. Uh, I think we're in for a much better year. I think it's going to be much more fun to watch. I think the defense is going to. Uh, be have a far superior product out on the field and i really think in the fourth year and thanks to uh mostly ryan fitzpatrick sort of calmness i think Jameis is going to put it all together this year and have his best year as as a buccaneer so uh the arrow is trending up uh brent alluded to i have to say it and this is what i always say at the end of our podcast Uh, i know the link to my twitter account will be there but if you do want to follow me on twitter because it's sort of just one speech uh it's at rendax r-e-n underscore d-a-x-t and i'm always down to talk buccaneers football there you go so uh, thank you guys so much for watching this live stream um if you're watching this you know post and you have any other suggestions for live stream opportunities or just overall video content you know let us know down in the comments section below anyway thank you guys so much for watching and as always uh we'll see you in the next video or live stream but until then goodbye for now guys see ya